Uh, we started off this morning in 2 Samuel chapter number 1, and uh, I preached on the story of Mephibosheth from the perspective of the salvation of a sinner today. And I uh, did that this morning, but there's another perspective here uh, that we can look at in this passage, and, uh, coming from 2 Samuel 19, that gives us an even more appreciation of the story. And uh, that's what I want to look at, and that's the perspective of the faithfulness of a saint, the faithfulness of a saint. And uh, you can go on and on. I was talking to Miss Nicole about this. One of the amazing things about the Word of God is simply that it is inexhaustible. You can read a passage and you can just, uh, you can read a passage and you can pray and you can study. And uh, I promise you, you will just, it will just keep on. It's a dynamic book tonight and it will just keep on. Uh, it's a living Word. And, and I tell you, I, I, as I was studying, I was just like, Lord, where do you want me to stop at? Because there's so many different ways, so many different messages that, that, that come to mind out of these verses. And I really feel like uh, this is where the Lord would have us to be tonight. And so uh, let's look in 2 Samuel chapter number 19, and let's look in verse number 24. Read it with me tonight. In, uh, verse number 24, the Bible says, And Mephibosheth, the son of Saul, came down to meet the king. And, and had neither dressed his feet, nor trimmed his beard, nor washed his clothes from the day the king departed until the day he came again in peace. And it came to pass when he was come to Jerusalem to meet the king, that the king said unto him, Wherefore wentest not thou with me, Mephibosheth? And he answered, My lord, O king, my servant deceived me, for thy servant said, I will saddle me an ass, that I may ride thereon, and go to the king, because thy servant is lame. And he has slandered thy servant unto my lord the king, but my lord the king is an angel of God. Do therefore what is good in thine eyes. For all of my father's house were but dead men before my lord the king. Yet didst thou set thy servant among them that did eat at thine own table. What right therefore have I yet to cry any more unto the king? And the king said unto him, why speakest thou any more of thy matters? I have said, Thou and Ziba divide the land. The Mephibosheth, and, and Mephibosheth said unto the king, Yea, let him take all, for as much as my lord the king is come again in peace unto his own house. Now, let me begin tonight by giving you just a little bit of background on this passage. Some 15 years after what takes place in 2 Samuel chapter 9, which I preached about this morning, when Mephibosheth were introduced to him, uh, he's, he's, in the, uh, uh, he's in the land of Lodabar. Uh, we know that he's a cripple, he's lame, uh, he's, he's there, he's in, the land, he's in the barren land, and uh, uh, wasting away, and, and David remembers a promise, a covenant that was made to Jonathan and Saul some many years ago. And so he tells Ziba, he finds Ziba, and Ziba knows about Mephibosheth. He tells David about him. And David goes out and seeks to find Mephibosheth. Once the guards find him, they bring Mephibosheth back to the throne room of David, where David gives him everything pretty much. He takes him in. He adopts him as his own son. And what a beautiful picture of amazing grace that we have in the story of David and Mephibosheth right there in chapter number 9 of 2 Samuel. And uh, and so here we are some 15 years later. Uh, nothing more is said about Mephibosheth until we get here 15 years down the road. And we find that Absalom has led a rebellion against Against his father David, and David has been driven out of Jerusalem. David, uh, uh, David, uh, uh, or Ziba, David's servant, and the overseer of Mephibosheth, Jonathan's son, has cheated Mephibosheth, so to speak. Uh, 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 it just so happens here, we're told that he's cheated Mephibosheth and deserted Mephibosheth and left him behind with Absalom, even though 
he supposedly wanted to go with Ziba. As a matter of fact, you can read about that if you turn back uh, just a couple chapters in chapter number 16. Look at what verses 1 through 4 says of 2 Samuel chapter number 16. It says, And when David was a little past the top of the hill, behold, Ziba, the servant of Mephibosheth, met him with a couple of asses saddled, and upon them two hundred loaves of bread, and a hundred bunches of raisins, and a hundred of summer fruits, and a bottle of wine. And the king said unto Ziba, What mean thou buy these? And Ziba said, The asses be for the king's household to ride on, and the bread and summer fruit for the young men to eat, and the wine that such as that such as be faint in the wilderness may drink. And the king said, And where is thy master's son? He's talking about Mephibosheth right there. And Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he abideth at Jerusalem. For he said, Today shall the house of Israel restore me the kingdom of my father. What he pretty much said there, Ziba looked at him and said, he sided with Absalom, is essentially what that means. Verse number four says, Then the king said, or then said the king to Ziba, Behold, thine are all that pertained unto Mephibosheth. And Ziba said, I humbly beseech thee that I may find grace in thy sight, my lord, O king. Now Ziba tells David that Mephibosheth sided with Absalom right there. And now, uh, fast forward again, where our text is tonight in chapter number 19, uh, Absalom is now dead. And David is returning to Jerusalem. And and he meets Mephibosheth, whom he thinks has been a traitor. Now, Mephibosheth was probably the last person he expected to see here. Yet here he is in verse number 24 of 2 Samuel chapter number 19. Prince Mephibosheth is not arrayed in princely robes. He's not arrayed in sweet-smelling oils, golden chains, or rings as a member of David's court. Instead, he's a mess and he stinks. The bandages on his crippled feet have not been changed at all. His beard or his mustache had not been trimmed. And this was a sign of shame. It was a sign of sorrow and mourning because back in that day, beards were cared for with great pride and with great joy. They were very special to the men and they were, they were, kept, they were always kept well groomed. And he also stunk here. He had not washed his clothes since the king's departure. Now Mephibosheth had no desire, it seems, to live in comfort while the king was a fugitive. I believe it was his intention to show his grief and loyalty to David and others, even though he might have, even though he might would have been hated by Absalom. And Mephibosheth longed for the presence of the king. He longed for the king's return. His attitude was a great example for you and I tonight. We should long for God's close fellowship each and every day. That longing can be fulfilled because the Holy Spirit indwells each and every believer tonight. We are able to fellowship with the Lord because of His presence in our life. Romans chapter 8 verse 9 says, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Now listen to me tonight. We also as children of God should be longing for the return of Jesus Christ. See, Mephibosheth was, was helpless. He was a helpless cripple. He was waiting for a better time. And the better time finally came right here. And God's creation right now is waiting for a better time. Romans chapter 8 verse 22 says this, For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Now, and not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even when even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? Do you remember last Sunday, Easter Sunday, when I pointed out that those words about the first fruits and how Christ was the first fruits. It's evidence that there's going to be a greater resurrection one of these days. He's simply the first fruits. And here we find it again in Romans chapter 8. And it's talking about how we groan and the Spirit groans within us for us 
as believers, better times will come when our King Jesus returns and when we go to heaven tonight. That will be our better day. I want you to notice something here that convicted me. And if I were you, I'd underline the very last sentence in verse number 30 of chapter 19. This is something, if you're just reading it, you, you may just pass it by, but this is amazing. It convicted me. In verse number 30, there's a magnificent statement of love. Look at what Mephibosheth tells King David. There at the end it says, And Mephibosheth said unto the king, Yea, let him take all. He's talking about Ziba. For as much as my lord the king is come again in peace unto his own house. Listen to me tonight. Here Mephibosheth says he was deserted by Ziba. When David has to decide, he doesn't really know what to say it seems like. And who's telling the truth? And Ziba, is Ziba telling the truth? Is Mephibosheth telling the truth? Maybe David makes the decision to just divide up the land to keep unity. I don't really know. But David splits the difference, which seems technically if Mephibosheth is telling the truth, it seems unfair to Mephibosheth. But in spite of all of that, look at what Mephibosheth says. He doesn't even care for the inheritance because he loves his king so much. Mephibosheth's attitude here in verse number 30 is this. It's okay, king. Zippa can have it all. I'm just happy that you've come back for me. Yeah, that's what he says here in verse number 30. Things, listen to me, things were not as important uh, as fellowship and peace with the king. And my friend tonight, is that the kind of priorities we have with King Jesus tonight? Is it? Is it? Philippians chapter number 3 says this. Verses 7 and 8. The Bible says this. But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. That's what it's all about. But is there priorities in those same places? Does it matter to you tonight? As long as you've got the presence and the fellowship with the King, does anything else matter to you tonight? It shouldn't matter. But I'm afraid to many of us it does. I'm afraid that if we were like Job or even if we were like Mephibosheth and everything was taken away from us, I've got a feeling that a lot of us would just sit down and get mad and we'd quit on God. Because if we can't have things our way, we're not going to have them. But not these guys. Not these guys. Not, a, not, not Paul as he was writing there. No, he counted all things as done. They were worthless. And then Mephibosheth here said, Hey, King David, I don't care. You can give him all of my inheritance as long as I've got fellowship with you. That's all that matters. I'm just glad that you're here. I tell you what, that's what it should be with all of us today when it comes to God Almighty. When it comes to Jesus, we should count everything else as lost tonight. Shouldn't matter. Nothing else in this world should matter except Christ Jesus. Now I mentioned a little while ago about who was telling the truth here. Who's telling the truth? You've got Ziba saying back in chapter number 16 that Mephibosheth had abandoned David and had sided with Absalom. But now Mephibosheth shows up in chapter number 19 and, and, and uh, uh, tells, tells uh, David here in our text that Ziba had deceived him and lied to David about it. So who's telling the truth? We've got two stories now. One thing you don't find here. Is this right here? And I find it interesting. You don't find David asking any questions. You don't find David pitting the two uh, against each other. He never sits both of them down and says, I want the truth. Somebody fess up and tell me what's really going on here. You don't see that here. I find that very interesting. You know what I wonder? I wonder... If it's because, I wonder if the fact that David doesn't ask because it doesn't matter. You remember I preached this morning on those promises. 
And that promise that David had, that promise that he that he promised Saul and Jonathan, and that he would take care of, of them. He wouldn't kill anybody in their family. He would take care of. I wonder if it was because of that promise. I don't think David asked because it don't matter. If Mephibosheth is lying, he stays. If Mephibosheth is telling the truth, he stays. His place in this palace didn't depend on his behavior. It depended on the promise. Y'all get a hold of that? I've been preaching on Wednesday nights about real Christianity and how Christianity is a relationship. It's not a religion. It's not a big piece of, it's not a big set of laws where we have to keep laws and then if we break one, we're all of a sudden uh, uh, excommunicated from the love of God. No, that's not how it works. We ought to want to please our Savior. We ought to live holy for He is holy. But let me tell you something. We're not perfect tonight. And I'm glad that just because I failed tonight doesn't mean that I'm lost and I'm going to hell. Yeah, somebody ought to say amen right there. That's not a license to sin. Don't you dare misinterpret what I'm saying. But I'm thankful tonight that we are human and sometimes we mess up and I'm thankful that I can pick up and I can ask my Heavenly Father to forgive me of that and I'll pick up and I'll go on and go on and He'll help me and we'll move on for the glory of God. I'm thankful for that tonight. And the same thing we see right here. You know, we wonder, I wonder, to think a minute just about, about, uh, about David's loyalty here. Listen, I, I said it this morning, Mephibosheth, he brought nothing to the table. He didn't even know that David was looking for him. But David gave him everything. I think if we were able to ask David this evening, what, where did he get this kind of love? Where did he get this kind of promise-keeping mentality from? I think he'd just point us from his story to God's story tonight. God set the standard today for keeping covenants, did He not? Think about what the Bible says in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 7 verse 9. Know therefore that the Lord thy God, He is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love Him and keep His commandments to a thousand generations. That's a long time, ain't it? God makes and never breaks a promise. Remember what I closed this morning with? I'm going to close with it again tonight. Titus, the book of Titus, chapter 1, verse 2. The Bible says, In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. That promise tonight runs like a scarlet thread through the tapestry of Scripture tonight. I know you remember the promise to Noah over in Genesis chapter 9 verse 11 says, And I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood. Neither shall there be any more uh, be... Neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. Let me tell you, every single rainbow tonight is a reminder of God's covenant tonight and let me tell you this something very interesting about a rainbow did you know that a rainbow is actually a full circle every rainbow is a full circle the only problem is you and i can't see it from our perspective because of the horizon but if you were to be up in a plane if you were to be out in space you would actually see a rainbow as a full circle and uh, can I just stop for a second right there and say that that means so much to me because God's promises are just like that full circle rainbow. They're unbroken. They're unending. They are full circle promises tonight. Amen. I preached back in January here on a promise made to Abraham. 
Back in Genesis chapter 15. I don't know if any of you remember that or not. But in Genesis chapter 15. Uh, in verse 17. The Bible says. And it came to pass. That when the sun went down. And it was dark. Behold a smoking furnace. And a burning lamp. That passed between those pieces. In the same day. The Lord made a covenant with Abram. <clears throat> saying unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. Now what's going on right there? Well, God had told Abraham that his descendants would be as many as the stars in the sky. Now to secure the covenant, God had Abraham cut several animals in half. And remember back in that day, the culture of that day, to seal a covenant, both parties would pass between a divided animal, which would be symbolic of saying, if I break the, if I break my word, the same fate will lie on me as this dead animal. That's how they sealed a covenant or a contract or a promise back in that day. And you remember how God, how Abram went to sleep and how God walked through that animal sealing that covenant for himself. And Abraham didn't do it. Abram never went through it. Abram had nothing to do with the covenant. And it showed that the covenant had everything to do with God and nothing to do with Abraham. Oh, it's a picture of grace tonight. It's a picture of what Christ would do on the cross and how God would pay the sin debt for a broken generation. It has nothing to do with us. It's all God. Same thing with Mephibosheth. I'm telling you, the whole Bible points to Jesus tonight. And it points not only points to Jesus, it points to the finished work of Jesus tonight. God takes His promises seriously. And He seals His promises dramatically. What about Hosea? We all know who Hosea was, don't we? Do you remember Hosea? God commanded Hosea to marry a prostitute named Gomer. Hosea obeyed. And Gomer had three children. None of them even being Hosea's. And Gomer abandoned Hosea for a horrible life of sin. And she finally finds herself on the auction block being sold off as a slave. Hosea steps up. After all of that, after all of what she put him through, he steps up on that auction block and he buys her back. Oh, what a beautiful story that is. Oh, what beautiful typology of the Savior and how He bought each and every one of us off the auction block of sin. What did, why did Hosea do all of that? The Bible tells us, Hosea chapter 3, verse 1. He said, Then the Lord said unto me, Go yet, love a woman beloved of her friend, yet an adulteress according to the love of the Lord toward the children of Israel who look to other gods and love flagons of wine. What he's saying there is it's to be a type of the love that Jesus had for the children, or the love that God had, the Lord had for the children of Israel. He loved them so much even though they were an adulterous generation. They, they, uh, they, they went, as the Bible says, a whoring after other gods. They loved their wine. They loved everything else but their God. But yet He loved them anyways. And He went to the auction block of sin after they messed up and He bought them anyways because He loved them. I'm thankful tonight that we have a God that loves us. I'm glad tonight we've got a God that keeps His promises. You want to know about the promise keeping of God? Just look at Noah. Just look at Abraham. Just look at Hosea. Just look at Mephibosheth today. If you want to know about God's covenant keeping, there's nothing that we can bring to the table for God tonight. He just wants us. Just like Mephibosheth, David sold him out. David gave him a place at the king's table for the sake of Jonathan. And God sought each and every one of us out and gave us a place at His table for the sake of Jesus tonight. Not because of our IQ. Not because of our retirement accounts. Not because of our leadership skills. But it's all because God made a promise. Eternal life tonight. 
is covenant caused. It's covenant secured. And it's covenant based. Titus chapter 1 verse 2 says in hope of eternal life which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. And it's all right here in the Old Testament. In the story of Mephibosheth. I said it this morning and I hope I never get over it. We're all just like Mephibosheth. And I don't ever want to get to get over that day when a messenger came by my way and said, Hey buddy, the king wants you to come sit at his table. Why? Because of a promise that was made that's never going to be broken. And that's the same promise we have tonight. The promise of eternal life. All we have to do is accept it. Let's pray tonight. Dear Heavenly Father.